Marco, welcome to the Run Testers. Thanks very much for joining us. Before we go kind of get deep into heart rate variability, could you just tell us a little bit about your kind of your experience, your expertise, your own kind of training and kind of um, what got you into this kind of area in the first place? I have a background, um, let's say a technical background in computer science and engineering, um, PhD in data science. So I've been mostly working, you know, with software and data for a long time. Um, a bit, I would say, randomly when I was doing my master's, I ended up in a research um, institute through a contact at university in which we started looking at what were maybe the first wearables like 10, 12 years ago, sensors to measure um, cardiac activity, activity of the brain, uh, stress responses, exercise, all sorts of things. Uh, we would make you know, the hardware of these prototypes and then work at different levels with the software and eventually the analytics to interpret this data. And that I think there is when I got more um, into measuring the body as the source of the data that then I ended up analyzing mostly and trying basically to get some useful insights out of that. And personally, I've been always passionate about, you know, building tools for people to use. And I think it was also the right time, you know, we had um, the first Android phones, the first iPhones, people could make apps. Uh, then you had, I would say the first sensors that could be paired easily to a phone, uh, test straps from Polar, things like that. So you could finally build something that was not just a research prototype, but, you know, anyone could use. And that's a bit where it started. And, you know, I then built HRV for training. So our solution, let's say, to measure heart rate variability and physiological stress. Um, got more interested into sports and exercise, went back to university to do another master's in sports science, uh, you know, learning a bit more of the theory of what I've been applying through the technology. Uh, yeah, and that's a bit the journey. Myself, I'm just a recreational runner, um, you know, enjoying the sport daily, but uh, no specific talents there. I guess it, with, with heart rate variability, we'll get onto this, but you don't necessarily just have to use it for sports, right? It can be used outside. I mean, but before we before we go into that, it'd be great if you could just explain to people who might not be aware of what it is, uh, yeah, how it how it works and why it's important. Um, you know, heart rate variability is uh, basically the only non-invasive marker of stress that we have, um, which makes it effective at uh, you know capturing the body's response to stress. And when we talk about stress, it's really anything. So in the context of uh, exercise, typically training is a significant stressor because, you know, that's what we do every day, preparation for whatever event we care about. But of course, there's always multiple stressors playing a role. Um, you know, our lifestyle, what we eat, uh, alcohol intake, um, any other stressor that might be a bit outside of our control, uh, work-related, family-related. Uh, you know, in the past two years, <laughs> we've seen a lot of different stressful situations also but mostly outside of our control so those kind of things affect us and obviously our ability to handle stress and cope with stress and face additional stressors is limited right we cannot we can only take so much uh, and that's why measuring heart rate variability can be an effective way to seeing basically and capturing where we stand how we respond and maybe make some adjustments and you know as you say this is just a, a generic tool. It's not specific to training. The reason why it's applied more in the context of training typically is that athletes of any level, I would say, are just more motivated in uh, you know, capturing these signals, looking at the data, and the actionability part is also a bit easier. Uh, you, know, you can always tweak your training a bit, but you know, if there is some other very difficult stressor to handle, you know, it might be something that you have uh, yeah, less ability to change. And the technicality of what it's actually tracking, can you just give us a little bit of the detail on what, what it's actually sort of monitoring? Yeah, so when we talk about heart rate variability, we basically look at the differences between heartbeats in time. That means that normally we need to collect data for a certain period of time. The bare minimum for what we do normally is a minute. And that's actually as good as longer recordings, but historically, uh, five minutes would be used, but at, at this point, you know, it has been shown that less data is fine. In this minute of data, you look at the differences between consecutive heartbeats because, you know, the heart does not beat constantly. 
So even if we have you know 60 bits per minute, it's not one exactly every second. You know, it could come a bit earlier, a bit later. This is also modulated by breathing. So heart rate you know increases a bit as we as we breathe in and decreases as we breathe out. Small changes, but then all of these changes are basically regulated by the autonomic nervous system. And that's why uh, this is something that becomes relevant in the context of stress. As we face stressors, the autonomic nervous system has a certain response, which basically influences this variability that we measure. So if there is more stress, the variability becomes less. And that's something you can capture in different ways. Uh, and that's why you, know, you can basically use this parameter as a marker of stress. And so that's why if you see, you know, I guess in a lot of numbers that we look at and you're looking for numbers to sort of go up as an improvement, and that's the same case here, generally speaking, or there's some nuance to it, I understand. Yeah, for sure. Let's say that generally speaking, yes. So, you know, suppression highlights higher stress. I think what's more important there, uh, you know, with respect to other parameters people might be used to, um, to dealing with is that heart rate variability does not really have um, you know, absolute numbers or absolute ranges that you can compare to once you, it's not something, you know, you can measure and say, okay, I'm here with respect to, you know, the population or even just people similar to me. Um, there's a strong genetic component, which means that much of the variability between people is not really associated to factors like fitness, for example. Um, a strong component is aging. So something also we cannot really influence that much. You know, older people have a lower HRV than younger people. Um, so the absolute value itself is not telling us so much. At that point, maybe even resting heart rate is a bit more useful because that is more associated to fitness, right? As you get fitter, your resting heart rate reduces. Your HRV does not necessarily change that way. So the way we use it, is slightly different. We always interpret it with respect to your own historical data. So the first thing, you know, is always collect some data, see what's your normal. And then yes, when you see changes towards higher values, that's typically a good sign of a good response. If you see suppressed data, lower values than the opposite, it means more stress is present. But I guess, you know, if you're training for, if you're going through like a 16 week training block for a marathon, you're gonna want some stress to be applied there so a lower number isn't necessarily an overall kind of negative thing you're going to be sort of seeing i guess peaks and troughs i think it depends a bit what i mean is that um yes we want to apply stress for sure but we want also to be able to respond positively to that stressor so what hrv is telling us when we have um let's say a negative score a low score it's not necessarily that we did not um apply you know, the right stressor or that the stressor was too strong or anything like that, is that the body did not, did not respond well. So if the score is actually normal or within your normal or positive, it does not mean either that you did not apply stress. It means that you responded well to that stressor. So it's really about the response because you know, we have many ways to quantify the workout. So you, know, you, know, you did your session, it was a hard session, it was the right stressor, and then you have positive physiological response. It does not mean you didn't do the session right. It means you know you were ready to deal with that session in that moment. So that's typically the response we want to see. And, and again, a drop here and there is nothing to, to worry about. Typically, we try to implement changes when you know we have more consistent low values so that you know it's a stronger stressor present for several days, but still. Um, normally, we really want to see a response that is around your normal values without that much fluctuations or um, many su suppressed scores. I guess one thing we're seeing, we're seeing more of the, the HRV arriving across lots more kind of mainstream wearables. Is there a protocol that you have to kind of follow in order to get the best out of these when you're using them? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Indeed, as you say, now there is um, there are many sensors, many different companies making um, either wearables or HRV apps or all sorts of things uh, that you can use to measure physiology. But I think it's important to do it in a certain way if you want to capture uh, what we call, you know, baseline uh, physiological stress. Your resting physiology should be measured either first thing in the morning. So, you know, you wake up and, for example, you see 
an app like ours or others that allow you to measure, you know, with the phone. Um, and you take a snapshot of your resting physiology before you do anything else, you know, before breakfast, before coffee, before, you know, reading your email or, or sort of things that, you know, could create transient stressors, which, you know, would go away quickly, but then it will just impact when you measure. So that's something uh, that becomes problematic and it's easily solved just by measuring first thing in the morning, typically while lying down, still in bed, uh, that's all you need to do. The alternative, which also works very well, is to use a device that measures the full night. Um, so there, I think what matters is really to use something that captures at least four or five hours of data, ideally the whole night of data, because basically, you know, uh, sometimes we think the best moment to measure must be while you're unconscious, right? Because when you're awake, you could influence the measurement and, and things like that. But the thing is that when you're unconscious, your autonomic nervous system is actually not just not doing anything, right? There are situations like, you know, when you're in your REM sleep in which your autonomic nervous system is extremely active. So it's important not just to take a snapshot there dur during the night because you'll be capturing, you know, a different sleep stage, a different phase in your circadian rhythm, right? So early in the night or late in the night, your HRV is very different because, you know, you're processing stress they're going through just the regular ups and downs of the 24 hour cycle. So, you know, long story short, if you use a device, for example, I do some work also with Aura. I think you have a ring. Um, <laughs> yes. the, the Aura ring measures, for example, the full night. So it gives you an average of your HRV. And that measurement typically um, is very well correlated with morning measurements is a reliable snapshot with uh, of resting physiology, so another good way to, to track it. And then I guess some people may, you know, like me, I'm carrying, I've got like four watches, or not everyone will have four, you know, we test a lot, but um, some people might have a couple of different devices that they're using. You might get two different scores. I, and could you explain a little bit about why it's not necessarily a great thing to sort of compare those scores ne together next to each other? Yeah, I think many of these devices these days um, let's say start from HRV, but then build up some different sort of scores. You know, it could be what they call the readiness or recovery or freshness or some sort of aggregate score where they put together different signals, uh, which in principle, of course, makes sense, right? So you want to try to use the information you have to provide something useful for your user, keep the user engaged and all of that. At the same time, I think sometimes, um, you know, obviously there is no reference there is no gold standard or truth or of what is you know again recovery or readiness or all of that so they basically come up with methods to integrate all of these signals but that does not necessarily agree with you know your specific condition or between each other because maybe some of them give more weight to what they think is your sleep quality or maybe to um, how hard they think you exercised yesterday. All things that also are a bit flawed in the way we quantify them, right? There is no perfect way to quantify sleep, to quantify exercise. So, you know, all of these things um, can be useful in certain situations, maybe especially when you have some sort of acute stressors that I think we all can see are captured uh, effectively, like, you know, we get sick. Most of these devices will agree and show that, you know, something is not going well there. But then on the day to day, when things are more stable or we are training well, I think it can be more effective, especially for athletes or coaches to use, uh, you know, the actual physiological data. So I think heart rate, HRV, I rely more on those uh, more than other aggregate scores. And if, if I, I'm kind of, if I'm not lucky enough to have a coach, I'm just a sort of regular runner using this. Could you give us a sort of a, a window into how best we should apply it? So like on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis, when I look at it, what do I do? When, how do I make decisions about how, whether I should train or rest or what to do? Could, could you give us a bit of advice? Yeah, for sure. So I think uh, what's important there first is to understand that um, you need to start with a plan. So, you know, if you have a coach, great. If you don't have it, you know, still most likely you decide how to train based on some sort of periodization. You have your hard sessions, you know, your long runs and, you know, your recovery days and still start with the plan. HRV should not be used as a guide, you know, blindly without first 
um, having a solid plan because you know sometimes people think okay if my HRV is good I'm just going to go hard every single day until you know it's not good and then I will rest but then that's of course a recipe, a recipe for disaster because you know you will bring uh, you know your body to a situation that is of negative chronic response and adaptation and then it's just going to be uh, detrimental for long term you know performance and training so start with your plan once you know um, more or less what to do uh, at the higher level the way on a day-to-day -day basis in which you can use the data is for example you know measuring your hrv uh, tools like ours in hrv for training we basically try to provide to the user um, an understanding of where the daily score is with respect to their own historical data as you said before so no comparison with others you look at your score and you know the system will tell you okay today it's within where your normal range what we call it which basically means that you know what you see today might be slightly below or above yesterday or two days ago but that deviation is irrelevant it's just the day-to-day -day changes and there is no strong suppression everything is okay proceed with your plan so normally you should just not make any changes basically if everything goes well but then you know stress happens things happen and then the data often goes outside of that normal range that is yours. So you have a suppressed score or even worse, several suppressed scores, which bring maybe your baseline or seven days moving average, you know, just a different way to capture your recent trend basically uh, to a negative state, again, maybe a bit too low. And that's when typically in research studies or in these tools, we recommend lowering the intensity. So the change you make it's not necessarily to rest, uh, you know, depending on your level, right? Maybe you train every day and it's fine if you're not 100% still to train, but the intervention typically is scaling down the intensity. So you would take it, you know, if you had hard session, maybe you don't do the hard session today, you do a regular training or an easy session. And then, you know, if you had an easy workout, you can maintain it, or maybe you take a rest day. But that's the type of change is really about scaling down the intensity when your body is too stressed because simply uh, you're not in an ideal uh, situation to adapt to that stimulus. So there is little point than, you know, overdoing it, which in the long term would not happen. And I think we kind of shared on the email or I read on your, on the, on the blog, some, some insights. And one thing you kind of talked about was kind of this idea of proceed as planned, which is, you know, you've got that plan. That's your kind of, that's the backbone of what you need to do. And HRV really just gives you an indication of whether or not it's right to kind of proceed as planned, right? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, when you look at this data for elite athletes and, you know, they do train hard and many hours per week. But what you see typically is that, you know, most of the time, if not the entire time, they are within their normal range. And with, uh, you know, the typical oscillations you expect when they're responding well to a block in which they do a lot more, typically maybe a lot more aerobic volume than you typically see even increases in HRV because they are adapting positively to that stimulus. And then maybe they add certain blocks of higher intensity and, you know, things go down a bit, but always within their normal because, you know, that's what they do. And, you know, if there's a period in which nothing goes wrong, so to speak, that's the response really want to see is, you know, positive and again, proceeding as planned more than adjusting um anything but then again anything that happens that changes things um getting sick uh, allergies um you know just a night that you couldn't sleep again because maybe you have uh, i don't know a small child or something and you know anything that makes creates a disruption that basically is reflected in the data is simply a signal that you know because your stress is higher your ability to take more stress is limited and then it could be a good idea to again do that thing of just scaling down intensity a bit. Right now we're just about we're kind of entering kind of race season lots of people doing marathons we're recording this just before London's going to happen here and I guess the night before a race a lot of people maybe will have things that you know the stresses sort of surge a little bit is you know I sort of have read about round about this should people almost not look at the HRV on the race morning and just go and do what, what comes to them? To that point, you've, obviously you can't really influence what happens rather than, you know, when you get to that point, is there a point where you should just go, okay, I've, I've, I've used it in my training, but there's a switch off point and now I just need to go and do what I'm going to do? 
Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And certainly, so, uh, you know, we said those uh, psychological stressors can impact it. One thing that is very important is also to uh, understand that a low score does not mean you cannot perform. It means that, you know, you're not in the best place to adapt to the stimulus, you know, for the future. But, you know, if it is race day, then most likely you have planned, you know, some sort of off-season or recovery phase. So it doesn't even matter at that point. So normally it can certainly affect you psychologically, also in a way that, you know, maybe you are a bit excited for, for the race or your night is just different. Regardless of when you measure first thing in the morning or in the night, most likely it's going to be much shorter. You know, the race start might, might be earlier or, you know, if you're running a race that starts uh, in the evening and ultra or something that is at an, an unusual time. Also, you know, it's going to be, uh, yeah, at, at a, just a different time in which, you know, your physiology is going to be in a different state. So I think at that point, yeah, we shouldn't really think too much about that or read too much into whatever score you got that day. You might still collect the data maybe because you're just curious. There are ways typically in these tools not to see it. Um, in ours, if you, um, you know, you take your measurement and then there's the short questionnaire and it asks you also, what's your training phase? And if you say, I'm racing, uh, don't show the score, then it will not be shown, for example, so that you have the data, but you don't see the data before the race. Um, I think that, you know, can be, can be effective because things can always mess with our mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, t t yeah, definitely, definitely. And then I, I guess that's a really interesting thing with, with HIV for training. One of the, the differences, I guess, to some of the other wearables is that you, there's the questionnaire where you get to put some context around what's happening in your life. And that's quite an important differentiator, I guess, from some of the other wearables that try to sort of automate the tracking, right? Exactly. I think, you know, it's important to add context to physiology. If we look at the data, even for ourselves, it's uh, difficult sometimes to remember, okay, what happened three months back or two months back and why here I had this change or that change. I think that logging subjectively how we feel, um, what we do, other things associated to um, stressors, lifestyle stressors, and then things that maybe are not strictly associated to HRV, like muscle soreness, which still might be you know, a relevant thing to log uh, in the context of our training decisions. So all of that, I think, adds useful context for when we go and you know, look retrospectively at our data and uh, try to make sense of the changes we've seen and learn from that. One question I wanted to ask, I guess, was about the way that some of it's gathered. I sort of, in the past, I seem to sort of people would suggest that the heart rate chest strap was kind of the gold standard of measurement, but have things moved on? Obviously, HRV for training uses a very different system. You can use the sort of phone cameras. You could explain a little bit about that and actually then sort of how, how the app works. In um, our app, we use the phone camera, so you just place the finger here and then uh, basically the flash will turn on and what we measure is blood flow of course you know uh, the blood flows when the heart beats so that's something that uh, these days you can measure accurately it's the same principle that you have uh, yeah for the ordering or for any other device that uses optical measurements um, you measure blood flow and that's something that can be done accurately um, under certain circumstances which typically means uh, at rest so when there is no movement, that's why with these devices work well in the night, even the ones that maybe you use them during exercise and provide inaccurate heart rate. Um, you know, I have a Garmin watch, uh, which I like, but provides me with not so good data when I exercise. It does not mean that when you sleep, you cannot collect that high quality data. The context of the measurement is, is very important here. Um, the chest straps, uh, certainly great devices, uh, obviously a bit less convenient to use first thing in the morning, but also not all chest, chest straps are equal. So normally uh, polar straps or Garmin straps tend to be very good for this. They collect uh, bit to bit data very accurately. Uh, we did also clinical studies showing that, uh, you know, the camera measurement, the chest strap and the full ECG with gel electrodes and everything were equivalent. Uh, you know, again, at rest, so while lying down. So I think those tests, you know, are important to show that you can actually, uh, you know, back up what you say with the data and show that they are accurate and you can do it easily and more inexpensively, I would say. 
uh, at this point just using the phone, but you can also use some of other devices that, that have been validated. The main message I think is just always do a bit of your research to see, you know, the papers out there or the companies, you know, that they can back up what they say with some data because there is so much out there and not all of it can be trusted. And I guess we're seeing sort of some watches now, Apple Watch, this Coros has a, you know, you basically hold the hold the bezel. Um, and as I understand, some of them have, some of them have got kind of um, validation, some of them not yet, but um, I guess the idea is hopefully at some point those will again provide a bit of convenience if they can back it up with the right kind of um, right kind of studies. Yeah, I think you know it's um, it's easier for sure to collect the technology got there. And yeah, you mentioned also the Apple Watch is also a device that can be used to trigger measurements. Um, it sits in between the devices we talked about because it measures also a bit during the night, but not continuously. So normally, I would recommend if you have an Apple Watch to use it for a morning measurement, you can also always trigger one uh, using the Breathe app. So when you do that, the Apple Watch writes HRV to health and then an app can read it. So it's a bit of a workaround, but that was great. In the night, sometimes it's just some sporadic measurements. And as we said before, those can be confounded by different things. So it could not be uh, yeah, the most effective way to capture the data, but the measurement itself is accurate. So there is always you know, multiple sides to look at the accuracy, but then also when it is measured uh, and then you put it together to get something meaningful. And, and HRV for training will actually uh, use the so other sources, right? So you can actually use um, other devices to, to, to feed the app as well as the phone camera, is that right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we try to uh, provide meaningful insights based on the data and relying on sources that we think are accurate or we have validated. Um, you know, the Honor Ring, the Apple Watch, chest straps, uh, phone camera, all of those can be used depending on what you have or what you like to use. Um, and then the data is interpreted in similar way. You know, understanding what's your normal if you are deviating from that um, and all of that. And that's brilliant. I mean, it's quite a complicated subject. There's there's an awful lot that you can read. There's an awful lot you should go and read. Uh, I'll put a link in the caption of this, but Marco has written, uh, you know, brilliant, brilliant detail on all of this. If you really want to learn about kind of heart rate variability, he's the man to go and read up and, and it will give you everything that you need to know. Uh, Marco, if there was one piece of advice, one thing we, that most people who use it get wrong that you think, oh, you put your head in your hands all the time when you see people, what would that, that be? We would sign off with one, one, one nugget. I think maybe linking back to really understanding what's a significant change. That's something the software needs to do for you, but you know, people read too much maybe in small changes from a day to the other that are not relevant just because it's a variable that changes a lot. And we are not used to that. Heart rate does not change that much. Weight does not change that much. Blood pressure doesn't change that much, maybe either. Many things are you know, more in a constant range or within absolute ranges that we can compare to you know, others and things. And HRV is a bit different. There's a lot of day-to-day -day variability. You've got to measure every day and then you know, use the software that is able to tell you when you should pay attention to the data and when you should just you know, proceed as planned. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for, for joining us, Marco. That's been really, really insightful. We'll, we'll drop links to everything in, in the caption below. So we'll put a link up to the app as well. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming on. And uh, yeah, we'll go away and start kind of um, start guiding our training with a little bit more precision. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So there you have it. That's our deep dive guide to heart rate variability, courtesy of Marco. If you have any questions or comments, don't forget to hit us up below this video, ask us anything you like, and we can put some of those questions to Marco even and get some responses. We hope you've enjoyed watching. Hope you've learned a little bit about how to use HRV in your training. And yeah, as ever, thanks for watching the Run Testers and we hope to see you again soon. Oh, don't forget to like and subscribe.